I'm going to ask our panellists to come on stage now. Please give them a big hand. I'm going to welcome them on stage. Come on, give them a big hand. So we've got, um, in, in the order in which they're speaking, we're going to have Richard Stroud of the Global Drucker Forum. Richard is going to be looking at the vital role of management in, in the role of an organisation and, of course, in the role of learning and development in an organisation. I think too often we regard the learning and development department as having a direct relationship with individual employees. That's great. But management decides how people spend their time. Without management being involved and actually enthusiastically involved in learning, we don't get anywhere. So the role of management is crucial. Then we're going on to Helena Bargiel, Bargiel, sorry, who is going to be talking, sorry, <laughs> talking to us uh, of Leo Farm, who's going to be talking to us about how we can use value and showing value as a way to gain strategic influence. And then finally, we've got Joe Pokropsky, who's going to be talking to us about how we can change operationally what we do to get strategic input. And his summary is, look, stop treating every problem like it's a nail and you've got a hammer. We have a variety of tools in our toolbox. More people are coming in. You're welcome to come in. Again, if you've got a chair, and you can, if you can shuffle that way or shuffle into the middle of the group, that'd be lovely because people would love to be able to sit down. Thank you very much. That's great. All right. I should point out that all the speakers represent themselves. They do not, uh, they, they're, what they're saying do not, does not necessarily <laughs> represent the views of the organisation <laughs> they work for. All right. And with that done, time for me to shut up and hand over to Richard Straub from the Drucker Forum. Please, Richard Straub. <laughs> Thank you. Thank oh, you. Hello. So. Good morning, Thank ladies you. and gentlemen. I'm really delighted to be here. <laughs> um, I've been at Online Educa for many, many years in my IBM days, and then I, I had a, a pause during the last six years or so. So it's good to be back and to see many of the old friends. Now, the, uh, talking about the strategic role of learning and development uh, is a subject which in a way I could almost say haunts me since <laughs> years. Uh, because in various positions I was confronted with this question. Uh, when I was chief learning officer in IBM, it was a big subject in the late 90s. Um, I was uh, president of a group which is called European Learning Industry Group, where it was about the question of learning and development at the, at the European level. Uh, at the policy level. So again, the question how the European Commission was directly supporting with uh, the Commission of Vivian Redding at the time, the a, a joint industry initiative, which would ensure the right focus on, on learning and development in, in, in Europe. And uh, recently I've been deeply involved in this subject via an organization called EFMD, uh, European Foundation for Management Development, and the EFMD has a program where corporate universities are being certified or accredited as strategic organizations. So it's called, I don't know if anybody knows, it's called CLIP, but it's a thorough review of corporate universities, and the, one of the big questions in this program is how can you show your strategic relevance in the organization? Uh, so it's a subject which, uh, you know, comes back and back again. So, but on the other hand, we must ask ourselves, um, do we, is it like, you know, a remote target that we are running after and never achieving it, or are we coming closer? Uh, that's, I think, a big question we, we need to ask ourselves. Um, I mean, as, uh, as Don said, recently I've been dealing, recently for 11 years now, I've been dealing with the Drucker Forum, with the Global Peter Drucker Forum, which again gives a different perspective on these subjects. But learning and development remains one of the key subjects uh, we are dealing with there as well. I must apologize. Uh, I'm not using slides. Uh, you can imagine for an ex-IBMer, that's a big thing. <laughs> I, I had normally, I had a slide deck of at least of 30 slides for a presentation like this one, and now you need to concentrate on what I'm saying. So please 
bear with me. And I, I, I promise one thing, because for me, all these presentations are learning exercises for myself. And I will be writing it up. So I will provide something to you, but after, after the, after the uh, session. Um, now, uh, one of the fundamental issues may be when, when we think about learning and development and its strategic role is if we are framing the issue in the right way. Should we even talk about learning and development? Is this the key issue or should we talk about the problem we want to solve? There's something behind it that we want to address, but we keep talking about learning and development and human resource and talent organization and what, whatever. So I think um, uh, this is a, a big question. And uh, I, I, I would like, this is one of the tests I would also like to have. If I don't succeed to create at least one or even two cognitive dissonances during my, during my presentation, I failed. Yeah, that's, uh, that's important. So why talking about learning and development? Let's try to think about the problem uh, we would like to solve. And here, I want to go back to Peter Drucker, to his way of looking, uh, of looking at management, sort of to the, back to the basics. And uh, so those, is everybody familiar with Peter Drucker? Or is somebody not familiar with Peter Drucker? will know everything, so let's start from zero. Yeah, okay, okay. No, no, uh, but it's uh, always interesting. Who knows the Drucker Forum, by the way? Can you tell me? That's always a good test for <laughs> me. We have to communicate more, right? So that's, uh, uh, that's on us. So Peter Drucker was the father, he's called the father of modern management. I won't go deeper right now. He thought about the fundamental ideas of management, and he put it together in a systematic way. And what he also said, what I still think it is relevant today, uh, is uh, what are the key tasks of management and leadership. And he puts it this way. The first task is performance. The organization must perform. It's about collective performance. Uh, the second is about people. How do you ensure that people are in the right places where they can perform according to their strengths? That's a key management responsibility. It's not like shaping the person that it can perform, but it's understanding what the strengths are and putting them in the right way, in the right place. And the third is about community. So it's important, citizenship of the company, community, uh, um, supporting the local and the global uh, community, the common good in some way. But let's not forget, the sequence is clear. First is performance, because a company that doesn't perform cannot be a good citizen. That's as simple as that. And today, this is often forgotten. So this is where, where we start from when we think about, you know, the substance and what, what do we want to achieve. And then I would move uh, to a point, because this requirement for performance, what does it mean? It means in a very broad sense, innovation and value creation. Without innovation, the company cannot survive. If you don't innovate, you will inevitably die after a while. So innovation and value creation in a broad sense is essential. And as my good friend Alex Osterwalder, who is one of the top young thinkers in innovation now, he has been selected in the so-called Thinkers 50 ranking, he has become the number four thinker worldwide, right? So he is one of the top thinkers in, in innovation. And he puts it this way. There are two essential roles in, in the company. One is exploitation and one is exploration. And think about it against the backdrop of value creation and innovation. So exploitation is about running your business the business that you have, that you know already, where you have processes in place, where you have a business model. That's particularly important. Uh, uh, where you think about how can I make sure that this business is sort of funding my activities and making sure I, I, I can run from day, from day to day. This requires managerial discipline, no doubt. 
The other part is exploration, where it's about f creating your future, right? Finding out what is required tomorrow. This is about innovation in a much, the first, the first element, exploitation, is about more incremental type of innovation. But this one is about finding more disruptive type of innovation, creating something which is the revenue stream of, of tomorrow. For the, uh, for, the, for the exploitation, you need good business plans. <laughs> and for exploration, um, uh, Alex Osterwalder says the business plan is the best way uh, to, to kill your future. So you have to explore it, you have to find it, you have to find what your new business models will be. And that's a completely different, uh, different process. Now, um, when you think about learning in this context, completely different perspective. I'm not starting with l and I'm starting with the business and what the business requires. So if you think about that in a broad sense, of course in exploitation you have completely different requirements on the learning side, ranging in some cases, I take the extreme from compliance, that's an uh, extreme example, those who are confronted with these uh, questions, but also improving of, of processes, understanding your current model, learning about it, learning about the background. This is rather structured. You can do it using structured methods and you can plan, you can plan it in a systematic way. Uh, so the, the training, uh, the training uh, part of this will be training. There will be some incremental, uh, uh, some incremental innovation that you can cre create from it. But it's a different, it's a subject where you can move in a more structured approach. Now if you look at exploration, uh, that's a completely different ball game. Uh, at exploration, you are learning as you go. You are finding new things. You are sort of going in learning cycles. And uh, uh, if you think about the methods that companies today apply for exploration, it's, it's very clear. What are the methods? Typical examples. Lean startup. Lean startup is something you don't only use for startups, but you use for large corporations when it comes to exploitation, exploration. So lean startup, design thinking, uh, and um, the whole you know, uh, uh, agile movement which, which goes in this direction. And in all these, uh, in all these uh, methods, you can see an inbuilt learning cycle. You fail often, but you always have a, a method you, you, you want to learn immediately. Some people say fail fast is great. Yes, failing fast is great, but learning, <laughs> fast is, learning fast is even more important. So it's two areas where you cannot apply one strategic view and which are essential for the company. Yeah? Both are essential. You, ne you need your present business running and you need to be able to create uh, your, your, next, uh, your next business. It's all fundamental ways of value creation uh, and innovation. And in this context now comes the, the other big point we are all interested in. That means uh, the human potential in the, in the company. Because when, I have, when I'm involved in discussions now about management, the biggest issue coming up, how can we finally, uh, you know, create a space where the human potential can thrive, where people can provide something which, which really, um, you know, frees up uh, their, their potential and their capabilities, be it creativity, be it their ability to run uh, and exploit an existing business. That seems to be one of the big issues from a, from a management perspective. And uh, we just had the Drucker Forum in Vienna last week, uh, for the Drucker Forum for this year, and this subject came up in various ways, like Amy Edmondson talked about the uh, psychological safety that is so important when you want to have an organization which really uh, can, can create value, as, as I just described it. Or you have people like uh, Gary Hamill, who now spends his time, I can, I can say that uh, he really spends his time on it, 
How do we bust bureaucracy? How can we create organizations where individuals um, are not bogged down by bureaucratic structures? Uh, and in the same context, if you look at the big discussion of digital transformation, uh, digital transformation has two directions, basically. It can create a sort of new digital tailorism, or it can free up people uh, by creating structures which are much more nimble and much more flexible. And there are examples. I mean, we, uh, again, in Vienna, we had uh, the, uh, the company, uh, Hi the Hire Group from China represented, mm -hmm. and they completely yeah. re, um, reinvented the company by creating thousand and more micro-enterprises which are still connected in a framework, but where they have entrepreneurs in all these micro-enterprises that create value. So there are some things happening which are, which are quite interesting, and there are many examples which I, I cannot go into right, right now. But what I, what I would say, um, what's becoming more and more clear, there are a lot of techniques, there are a lot of management methods, but at the end of the day, it comes down to leadership. Hmm. We, are, we are coming back to this because the fact that Haya went in this direction and tried really a completely new model, or the question how you focus on creating the future of your company, I mean, this is a question of leadership. So, uh, a group, and it may be distributed leadership, but it's leadership. So let me, let me summarize um, a, a few of these thoughts uh, to bring it all together. I, I firmly believe that it's in, of vital importance uh, to reframe the, the way how we look at business and organizations, and in this sense, to reframe how we look at the, ro at the role of learning and development, and I would say not at the function of learning and mm -hmm. development, but at the role of learning and development. Uh, it must be part of your company philosophy, of your strategy, of your culture, it must be everywhere. And then a function can have a role to facilitate that. Yes, of course. But if the company if it's not part, fundamentally part of your of your philosophy, of your management, of your management culture, uh, you will have an uphill battle as a function. Um, I think in this way, if, it's, if this is part of the management culture, as uh, I mentioned before, as, uh, as Amy Edmondson mentioned, uh, as Amy Edmondson highlighted it, uh, if you have a culture where, for example, uh, the psychological safety is there, that people can speak up, can bring their ideas without fearing uh, to be, um, you know, to, to sort of impact their career in the, in the future, uh, that's essential for liberating the creative forces uh, within the company. And then you can operate uh, as learning and development function to provide the right tools and the right methods to support this. Um, there's a lot of knowledge in this function, and I, know, I think I know it well, even though I've stepped back now from being an actor, a direct actor in this function. There's a lot of knowledge and expertise which can be brought to bear, but it will, only, it will only work if you achieve the one essential thing to make sure that these ideas about what the importance of learning in the different areas of the business, what the importance is, if, if you are in a leadership role with this, if you are part of, le of the leadership, otherwise, Otherwise, it won't work. And leadership, the leadership roles are becoming very important, uh, what we also think in the Drucker Forum in, in the current, in the, um, uh, current discussion. So I, this is my only slide to that I will show to you, if I can. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> and we have deliberately chosen this subject for next year, and I can, I can do this. It's not an advert in this sense, but I think it fits well. We have a long-standing cooperation with Online Educar. We are friends, if I may say so, in a uh, partnership. Uh, in a, in a, in a, so we are complementary. We, we think 
Uh, we work together well. And leadership everywhere makes this point. Management as a discipline, as a systematic discipline, remains our focus. It's about, Drucker was about management. But what we are changing now is to look through the leadership lens. Because the real scarce resource in this century is leadership. We need more leaders than ever who understand more than their function, who can relate to the bigger picture, who understand the context in which we are operating. Uh, so it's, of course, a, a, a vital role and a difficult role, and there is no easy standard to apply. Because, as Drucker said, leaders, uh, how do you recognize leaders? By leadership competencies or whatever? No, you recognize them by followers. <laughs> they are able to attract followers. And this is a sensitive area for a company to understand and to manage. So leadership everywhere ties into the same subject. And what I wish you is to be leaders, to be close to the leaders you have in the company, and then you will succeed ultimately uh, to sort of uh, bring to bear the strategic role of learning and development. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Rich. Um, okay, I should thank you, Richard. I should point out, of course, I'm, uh, as usual, on my iPad following Twitter. So if you use the hashtag OEB19, uh, I will check, and, and there are questions coming through. There was one question from Jeff Stays asking, don't we, or it's an observation, really, that we need to, in exploitation and exploration, there isn't a clear dividing line, if I understand it correctly, a clear dividing line between methods of skilling people up. Explo if you, exploitation or using an organization more effectively is not purely about getting people, treating people as machines, but we have to be creative there as well. Is that fair enough, Jeff, as a summary? W would you agree that in the exploitation part, we have to uh, also be creative and help people learn well, rather than simply treating them as receptacles of knowledge. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I would agree. But there's a different type of, of focus, how you do it. You have elements where you, have a very, where you know exactly what you're doing and where you can sort of use traditional methods well. Because, you know, compliance uh, or even if you, if you have processes that run well, but you need to, in, to train people and educate people about them, this is a, but in, as I said, you have innovation there happening as well, incremental innovation, right? So you, you need to have a space there, also in the, on the learning side, how to support innovation, right? And, value, and, and new value creation in this space. Fantastic. We'll have more questions later on, so thank you very much for bringing that up. And the questions are already coming through. Thank you for that. But time to move on with uh, Helena Bajel. We try and... <laughs> Thank you, of Leo Farm. Before we step up, can we just get Helena's, Helena, Helena's slides up, please? And also, we have more people coming in, more people sitting down. I just want to check that we've got seats for everybody who wants to have a seat. So this is a good moment. If you are set on the carpet and want a chair, we've got a few seats at the front here. If you want to come down quickly, all right. Helena, okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, before I start, I would like us to do an exercise. So... Uh, you know, I'm coming from Leo, obviously. Is there anyone else from Leo in this room? No one? Okay, that means that I am the only one out of 6,000 employees standing here in front of you, so that's an honor. Are there any people here that are familiar with the 70-20-10 methodol methodology? Please stand up. I would like to see you. Charles, stand up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, quite many. Wow. And in addition to that, how many of you that are still sitting or standing are dealing with field forces? What? Sales people, you know, like me. No, 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 no. The one with 70, 20, 10, please stand up. Okay. I can see some additional people standing up. Okay, so let's agree that the responsibility of everyone standing up, everyone standing up, is to learn from each other, but also share your experiences with the people sitting down. 
right? <laughs> so please take a seat. <laughs> so this is what this is all about. So let's agree that we go beyond order taking, not telling what to do, but actually learn something from it. Okay? And also make learning something that we ask for actively, but also being asked to do from our top management. And that is what I would like to share with you how I did. As mentioned, I'm coming from Leo Pharma. It's a small Danish company owned by a foundation. The good thing with that is that we are not always so pushed because of shareholders to do things urgently. So sometimes that gives us a little bit more time to do things differently. And I have been in the commercial area longer than I would like to admit, but the last nine years I spent at Leo. First, on the global level, but after five years, I got a little bit bored because I didn't learn anything. And then I got the option, because the EVP for a new region, Region International, reached out to me and said, Helena, what about joining my team? We need somebody, something within commercial excellence. I don't really know what that might be, but you find out. And that is the best thing that can happen to me, you know? There is a blank sheet, there's something to do. So, yeah, I accepted. The first day on, in the new region, he told me, by the way, I expect you to deliver a plan on what you're going to do in three weeks' time and present to the leadership team. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then you have to know that I didn't have the relationships in that region. I mostly, in my global role, I worked with Europe and I worked with US. Not so much with this. So Region International is anything from China to South Latin America. So that is my region, the dark green. And I was like, okay, three weeks time, coming up with a plan for commercial excellence, that's funny. So what I did, I sent out a survey to the people and asked, what do you need? But I also asked certain questions, trying to see where they were. Guess what the answer was for m most of them? Anyone? I know that I have one over there that I can ask. Yeah? So what do you think? Yes. We need sales training. That's what we need. But anyone from the field force here, could you help me out? What was the question or the demand from the field force then? What do you think? Don't take any additional days out of the field. So that was a little bit of a challenge. So what I did was to search the web, try to find something that could work on the job. And that's where I came across the 70-20-10 methodology. And then the dear leaders, they said, uh, yeah, and of course we have decided the country that you are going to work with. And that would be Algeria. Uh, you, you know, Algeria, me being a Swedish, uh, female going to Algeria, uh, and by the way, I didn't make it for the first workshop because the visa took too long. So what I did was to have a Skype meeting. And you know what? They didn't have Skype in Algeria at that point of time, so I had to use my own. And by the way, I don't speak French. I speak many languages, but not French. But Google Translate is quite good, at least if you want to understand. So we spent three days Google Translating, simultaneously translating, on a Skype, 
trying to identify what is needed in order to fulfill the needs of that market. And that was, of course, sales. Anyone that would have given up by now? No, 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 no. Not a chance. So, for the second round, when we have identified the needs, done the analysis, I finally made it to Algeria. And you know what? From that moment, I fell in love with Algeria. The people there were amazing. They really tried. They were committed. They wanted to do something differently. And they were very open with their needs. Because they needed a sales training, right? Everybody that is familiar with the 70-20-10 methodology knows that it's not as easy. So what I did was dig deeper, try to identify what really influenced the market. And there was one thing that was the same nominator, strategy. Everybody could tell the words of the strategy. Everybody could say that my target is X, Y, Z. But what it meant in a daily work, they really didn't understand. They didn't get the connection. What does it mean to me? So what I did when going out on the co-visits, and that was the hottest visit I've ever been. Has anyone been in the Algerian desert in the summer, dressed like this, and it's far, far beyond 40 degrees, it's hot. And nobody speaks English, and I don't speak French. But we made it work. And what we did was, after a call, pre, pre, uh, before a call, during a call and after a call, we dissecated each and every step and say, okay, so what did happen? Was that what you expected? What, how can you do this better? And what will you do next time? You know the methodology, right? So we used all those kind of small tips and tricks specifically tailored for you and for you to break it down, break down the strategy. And, yes, it went well. Sales were far below the target before it started. Six months later, we had a 34% increase above the target. Then my manager said to me, yeah, Helena, you know what? <laughs> it's just because Algira likes you. Can you make it work in China that we might start believe you? And I was still the only one. The only help I got was actually from a person sitting over there, flying into Copenhagen for eight hours to learn me about the methodology. But yes, we made it work in China. And for those of you that are interested in how that happened, there will be a session later on today. And as you can see, we have done that in uh, Russia, Brazil, as well, and also Egypt. So, being in Berlin, and everybody that likes ice hockey, like I do, the Performance Accelerator Program is like a sleeping bear. And everybody knows what happens when that bear is awake. It releases a lot of energy. So there is a lot of potential in linking the strategy to the business goals, to the tactics, to the very tactics, down to the very, very end user. It will be effectful. And since we did it, and linking back to what you said, Richard, because of that, we have released, we haven't used more resources. In many cases, we have 
improve the processes and automated processes that could be automated. And we have released people, money, to do innovative st things instead and it create, started to create new business models. This is what this is all about if we link it to the strategy. So with that said, I would like to say yesterday, this is what we assumed. But today, we walk hand in hand. That was all. I did. Stand for a oh. second. I love that. <clears throat> I love the sleeping bear, and of course, bear is the is the what would you call it, the animal symbol of Berlin. Mm -hmm. uh, I love this idea that you start with. People, people know what the strategy is, and they know what that means for them in their daily life. I need to do these things. But they can't translate that into what they need to do. No. So strategy, target, but what do I actually do? You made the link, so you improved sales from beneath, from below average to 34% yeah. above average. Yeah. And you improved that across the different geographies, honing it each time. But what was the reaction of the leadership to that? What was their view of learning development when you went back to them with that success? I mean, the first question I got, okay, so when will we be trained? <laughs> Where will we be trained? <laughs> yeah. And what I did, told them then is that while we, I have been doing this, the project lean in the market and also the people from the different functions, HR, sales, marketing, medical, finance, they have been part of this. I have, we have together develop this tool. We have to, to get a dive deep into what the root causes right, are. Right, right. So this wasn't something that dreamed up in the back room of learning and development no, and no, then pushed out. No. I just wanted to make that clear because it's very, the collaborative development of it mm. means that then you, you show your value to mm. the rest of the organization and then presumably they come back to you and say, well, as they did come back to you, well, it worked there and it mm. worked there. Let's have it elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. And then the perception of learning and development changes. Yes. So it's not the fulfillment house, it's someone who can help you meet your goals. Yeah. So we shift, and well, you, you have the nice picture of people walking hand in hand, yeah, yeah. To walking hand in hand with strategy. Yeah. And also, our goal is to become business partner, and I think that we have reached to that level. People often say to me, how do I become a business partner? And I always say to them, well, you just go and do your job as well as you can in one area and prove it, and then people come to you. You can't knock on somebody's door and demand it, but you can demand generate by doing a really good job. Helena, thank you very thank much. You. All right, let's get, yes, let's give a big hand to Joe. All right, we're gonna have Joe Pokropski uh, stepping up now. Joe is formerly JP Morgan, is that right? Former JP Morgan, independent consultant now, talking us through uh, what, what, what can we do, practically speaking, in his work as a consultant and what he's done at JP Morgan, drawing on those lessons to understand, well, how can we shift operationally from being a fulfillment house to having that more strategic impact? Joe. No, I appreciate it, thank you. Wow. <laughs> uh, voice of God. <laughs> As Don said, my name's Joe, uh, and I was thinking about this. Uh, it's really been my privilege to be a part of this global learning community for, I almost hesitate to say, about 25 years now. During that time, I've been uh, a classroom trainer. I've uh, managed instructional design organizations. As Don mentioned, I've done consulting to help other organizations uh, reimagine or rethink their learning strategy. And I've even had uh, the opportunity to lead uh, the learning organization at four global enterprises. And even as I say that, it sounds like I can't keep a job. But it's not the case. It's just been so much opportunity in L&D. And so uh, it's really appreciative. I've also had the opportunity to, to, to appear at events like this. And in fact, I was here almost a decade ago at at this event and delivered one of the early versions of this, of, of the workplace learning plenary session. And uh, during that time, I, I called on us as a profession, as learning professionals to, to embrace or to recognize what I called learning at the speed of need. And learning at the speed of need was really all about the thinking differently about how we did things, how we design, uh, develop, and, and implement training programs. But it was also about being much more closely aligned to business. Now think about this is 10 years ago about being more closely aligned to our business partners. So I was really grateful for the organizers to, to ask me to come back and, and talk a little bit about, you know, what the trajectory has been over the last 10 years. And, uh, and, and the good news is, I think in that, in that time, I've seen uh, a lot of progress. I think we've made progress. 
But at the same time, it sometimes feel like it, it, it's not quite enough or we're not moving fast enough that, that somehow we, we struggle to get out of our own way. I mean, here it is a decade on and I'm, and I'm still here talking about, you know, about this thematically. And so that got me thinking, you know, what, what is it? What's going on? What is a blocker? What, what, how come we can't get out of our own way, it seems, at times? And is there some, you know, catchy or memorable way we could discuss this so that we could bring in others, uh, other colleagues and, and partners to kind of discuss it? And that turned into uh, the title, as Don referenced earlier, uh, what I talk about today, to stop being a hammer looking for a nail. Stop being a hammer looking for a nail. Now, the original quote is actually, if the only tool you have is a hammer, then it's okay that you probably treat everything like a nail. Has anybody heard something like that, a variant of that? Yeah. I've heard it literally my entire life, certainly my entire career. It, uh, actually, Abraham Maslow said that in the Psychology of Science in 1966. And it turns out, I borrowed it somewhere along the way, and those that have worked with me know that I'm fond of saying we need to stop being hammers looking for a nail. Now, so, uh, it was shortly around the time of this event, uh, about 10 years ago, that the, the dots sort of connected for me, my aha moment. You know, the light bulb went off. And it was around that time I was, uh, I was uh, brought in uh, by a large financial institution uh, to, to reinvent, to reimagine their learning function. And so, you know, being somebody that wants to do this, uh, I wanted to get out very close to the business partners to understand what's their expectation of us? What, you know, how can we be of better service as we reinvent this learning organization? So I gathered uh, my new team together, and it was a sizable organization, right? So we had a training facilitators. We had an instructional designers. We, we even had an e-learning department 10 years ago, right? I had e-learning folks. I had technology uh, people to help me run the learning management system, and I brought along a project manager to help me kind of organize all that. And so we, we brought the management team together, and I dispatched everybody to go off and meet with our frontline business partners to kind of get an expectation from them of, of how we could be better. Now, the first one back, sort of the first meeting that finished, was, was led by our instructional design manager. And so I asked her, you know, how did it go? And she said, well, we we're about three or four sentences into the conversation, and I could begin to visualize, I could begin to very clearly see the classes that we were going to need to provide to, to help them. Okay. That second one back, it was my e-learning manager. So same question. How did it go? And he said, well, it took about 10 minutes or so into the conversation, and I, could then, I then sort of had a pretty good idea of the modules we had or that we were going to have to build, you know, to help solve their problems. In fact, it was a really productive hour. We spent the rest of the time together scripting out what those modules are here. And he handed me a list. Now, the third one was the project manager who came back. And I had sent the project manager out as well. I thought it might be good for some of our clients to hear a different voice, a different perspective than, than they had in the past. And he said something really interesting to me. It got me sort of on this trajectory. I asked him how it went, and he said, well, in fairness, Joe, about 60% of what they were talking about, I don't think it had anything to do with training. Now, there were a couple of things. I did hear a couple of things that if we had some kind of, I don't know, performance support or a desk drop or some kind of material for them, I think we, it's low-hanging fruit. We could add some value. As far as the rest of it, uh, not 100% sure. I, I, we might need to go back and spend some time with, I don't know, some of their better performers or something and, and really try to figure out what we need to teach them compared to what, say, they could learn on their own. I'm sorry, boss. He apologized. Sorry, boss. And it bothered me all night. <laughs> it got me thinking, that's really, really interesting. Now, 10 years ago, the first two responses were pretty much acceptable, right? I mean, that's often what kept our trainers and our design teams and our book of work filled and busy. And we even used it as a success metric, right? Because we could point to our business partners and say, look at this ever-increasing catalog of content that we built for you and claim that as a victory. But here was somebody, you know, so that's when, that's when it kind of struck me, right, that I had very obviously sent hammers looking for a nail into those meetings. I mean, it, now, in hindsight, does it surprise anybody that the instructional design manager could clearly visualize what classes had to be built or that the e-learning manager knew exactly what modules we needed? But the third person, right, that project manager, 
had no horse in the race, right? At least not in the traditional learning and development sense. They didn't really care if the answer was going to come back that we needed to facilitate a class or build a module of any sort. They, they were simply focused on what's the issue? What's the problem? What's the underlying issue and how is it impacting the, uh, the business results, right? They came away actually with more questions than answers at the time. And then I began thinking about it. That's probably how we needed to operate all of these years. And I would suggest that in today's business environment, particularly if we're going to be aligned more strategically with the business, it's probably really our only chance for success. And so that first major mind shift or change or trend that we're beginning to see and I think would be the appropriate thing for us to do, changing our operating model a bit, is to move from being the classic training department to being more of a performance consulting organization. As Richard said, it's about performance. If we're going to add value there, is that the move we have to make? And if we're going to do that, we've got to ask ourselves some pretty tough and challenging questions and really be brutally honest with the answers. So if we're going to be the classic training department, or are we going to move towards performance consulting? And another way to ask that question might be, are we comfortable being order takers? You know what I mean by that, right? If anybody's ever shown up at your office, to your team, and said, build me a 30-minute computer-based training module on, well, pretty much anything. Or we would like a three-day class, right? Or a five-day session on this or that. Then you know what I mean, right? That's order-taking. And historically, look, a lot of times that's where the training organization has been placed organizationally or thought of. The last stop along the road, not a strategic partner. Kind of like, well, we'll do some training, and we enabled that by always building the content to solve that need. Hammer, meat, nail. Right? Are we comfortable doing that? Or perhaps we could use that very question as the jumping off point for the consultation. Welcome that question. Come on in. Sit down. Why don't you tell me why you think a 30-minute module is the answer here? What's that five-day class? How did you arrive at that conclusion? Could you help me understand the behaviors you're trying to change and maybe get the priority straight? Yeah, so questions like that. Are we comfortable that the data from our learning management systems is the gauge of our success? Or should we be more aligned to the actual business outcomes? Are we comfortable being hammers looking for a nail? You know, or do we truly want to be strategic business partners? But you know, are we also prepared for the consequences that come along with that? But if you, if you buy into it, if you adopt this performance first mindset, you know, essentially that, uh, that sort of opens up some new avenues for you, right, in this, in this. And now you can begin to think about a lot of things differently, including how we design, develop, and, and, and implement any learning and training in the organization. And I would suggest that our businesses, if we, if we talk to them, if we're more aligned with them, would appreciate us pushing learning from the more formal way we've always done things in the past to pushing that out closer to the workflow, where the users are. Helena mentioned it. Richard mentioned it, you know, it's about performance, it's about not taking people out for large blocks of time, destroying their productivity, and trying to push this learning closer to the workflow. It's another place where we need to stop being hammers, right, to rethink how we do this. And it kind of gets to the, kind of the core question for me around, do we care what our people know, or do we care more about what they do? Do we care what they know or what they do? Now, in a way, it's a, it's a bit of an unfair question, right? Because the answer could be both. It's not binary. It's not yes or no, right? But, uh, and I can understand, uh, we, we mentioned compliance earlier. You know, I can see that compliance is one of those places where, we, you know, we care what they know. But by and large, in you know, the vast majority of the time, when it comes to performance in the business, it's about what they do, right? It's a lot less about what they know. And we have to fight that. It's almost a natural human temptation as an educator, right, as a subject matter expert, as a human resource professional, even as a parent, right? It, the, our natural temptation is to deliver information and then more information upon that and more information upon that in, in the hope that, you know, a well-informed learner is sort of the outcome, the end result. And in workplace learning, that's just not the case, is it? Right? Here, we need to know that they can do. Right? Um, the fact that somebody knows something doesn't necessarily follow that they even care. Right? Or when called upon to act, that they're going to be able to execute the tasks needed to demonstrate success. So I think we have to kind of guard ourselves a bit 
about that information overload and pushing things out into the workflow, well, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be a, a, a way to help do that. That becomes sort of the supporting strategy of the first piece, right? If you're going to move towards a performance consulting model, this gives you a, a, a way to get there. Your solutions are, begin to be built just enough and, and really no more. You know, they're, not, they're not disruptive to production. They're out there closer to the workflow. And a good way to start, right? People ask, well, how do I start? A good way to start is to flip the script. If we think a little differently, if we think differently than the way we've done it in the past, perhaps starting at the user experience and working backwards until you fix the problem or get them unstuck, and then stop. Build no more. That's all you need. If a performance support piece is all you need, then that's all you need. Don't build any more. But I know I've been there, right? We're going to have subject matter experts and sponsors of your training that insist there's more to it than that. There's other information you must give them. You know, by all means, build a reference library of that material. But that's a secondary activity, right? Your success shouldn't be tied to people using that material. That's just sort of there, I guess, for the, you know, I would say for the curious, right? Now, in the interest of time, I wanted to, to, to kind of table a, a third thing for us to consider today in, in our discussion um, about changes in our operating model. And that one, I would call it, you know, content creation versus content curation. You know, creation, curation. Beginning to see more of this as I work with organizations. And the question becomes, if we're again brutally honest, as a profession, generally speaking, it seems like our default mechanism has always been to create our content, to build our content internally. And look, I've heard all kinds of reasons why. I mean, over those 25 years, I've probably scripted a half a dozen of those reasons and used them myself, right? But, but the, the fact is, uh, the reason I hear the most, whether working for or with an organization, the number one reason I hear uh, to defend this has been, well, Joe, we have to customize the content for the way we do it here, right? which is another way of saying we're special, we're unique. But I think we have to call that into question, right? At the end of the day, it's most often from the subject matter experts or for those that believe they have a voice in the training that you're building because th they're experts. They, ha they want every piece of knowledge, right? Every nugget of information, all, every nuance to be expressed because that's the world they live in. They don't live in the real world where we have new joiners and new starters and people still on the journey to become experts like that, right? So I think we have to be, be careful when we're, when we're thinking about do we always have to build this content? There's also another elephant in the room that has to be addressed when it comes to content creation and curation. That is, look, that's how many of us got our start, got our jobs, remain employed. It's so often been the value proposition that we've offered, at least until now. And so, you know, there's a number of considerations, right? And, you know, you, you don't move real quickly in this space. We have, to, we have to think about this. We have to work through it because it could have impact on the people, some in this room or some uh, on the teams represented by the people in this room. But here's a way to think about it. If you're going to step into and adopt the first couple of ideas, we're going to move as strategic business partners to become more of a performance consulting practice. If we're going to begin to push learning to the workflow, that takes capacity. You need capacity. You need time and people to make that happen and to make it happen well. I look at new organizations I've been part of, and I'm willing to bet your organization's no different. Nobody's ever once, ever once in my career come to me and said, here's an open checkbook and unlimited headcount. <laughs> Doesn't happen. In fact, usually, right, we get, you need to do more with less. But you referenced it earlier, right? So that's the reality of the situation. So we need to create the capacity to do those first two things. And I would submit that one of the great places to take back capacity is simply to, I don't know, create less, you know, leverage more of what's available and begin to move ourselves into the, the realm of curating content and not always relying on being the creators of that content. The world is filled with terrific content. And look, to address that question about we're special here, <laughs> at the end of the day, ask the learner, ask the person on the front line who is stuck, who needs our help, who needs the, quote, training to get unstuck and back to work. And the reality is they don't really care whether you built that brilliant content or you borrowed it from me. They just want to get back to work. So the question becomes, 
What's your value proposition? That you can create or still create brilliant content or that you can become curators of brilliant content sets called from places all over, right? Not just inside your own organization that are always up to date, relevant and meaningful to me in the context of the role I'm performing. That becomes the question. Now, uh, I think I want to get us back on track here. We want to get to your questions. So I don't want to suggest that stopping being a hammer is, is easy, right? It's not. It takes time. Go slowly, right? It has served us well many times over the years. It's always going to be a part of our arsenal, right? But I can tell you this. I can, I can promise you that it is liberating and empowering and vastly more interesting to be included as a truly strategic partner with the business outcomes. I can also assure you of this, if it isn't already the expectation of your business partners, it will be very soon. Now look, some of you, if you're already there, I congratulate you, but for the majority of us, if you're still on this journey, well, that's why we're here today. We're here hopefully to help. So I'll turn it back over to Don and the panel. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Don't sit down for a second. A bunch, of, a bunch of questions. Can we get the three people slide back up again? Thank you. A bunch of observations came up while you were speaking, Joe. Laura Overton, uh, who's been doing research in this field for a long time, said, yes, Joe's right, but it's, I don't know what the word you used, Laura, was, but something like painful, <laughs> that we're hearing this again. Miriam, you said, yeah, I've recognised we're hearing it again, but you know what, we need to hear it again because we need to change. And Jeff, you put your familiar tweet up, and I don't say familiar in a bad way, saying what you said politely but in slightly blunter terms, stop writing courses, stop being a course factory. Mm. Right? Okay. Round of applause <laughs> from Joe. Um, now look, we have to write material sometimes, but how do we liberate time? the greatest time drag on any learning and development department is that business of producing courses. If we can get out of it some way, then we should. And I cite always the case of Andrew Jacobs, who was running Lambeth Council's training in the UK. 3,000 people, his team was cut from eight people to one, him. He could not write courses anymore. It wasn't a cut of 10%. It wasn't a cut of 20%. It was a cut of, uh, what would that be, um, 82.5%, 87.5%. And suddenly he had one person. He could not write courses. He found a way. I'm not suggesting you get rid of 87.5% of your people. What I'm saying is if you did face that, you would find a way to do it without writing courses. He did. Actually, he found, and I won't go into the details now, he found that it was a very successful way of training people up. Managers were much more involved. People learned as much as quickly. He is now running learning and development for the tax office in the UK, HMRC. So it's done his career a lot of good, and it helped Lambeth out. So it is possible to do it. Sorry, Joe, I'm, getting, I'm, doing, I'm doing an enthusiastic Doing a fantastic job. job. <laughs> okay, so listen, let's have a discussion about this, because for me, this operating model builds on the how do we get to the strategic intent, which Helena showed us, but, and it builds on the foundations that Richard laid us. Um, there's a whole bunch of questions come in, but I don't want to make this just a Twitter uh, exchange thing. Does anybody have a question they want to throw their hand up and ask immediately because you've, you've got something here you want to raise to the panel? Any burning questions? Yes, go ahead. I can hear you and I will repeat it back so everyone else can hear it. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so, so you're talking about the learning and development department? Yeah, yeah okay, so somebody, somebody says no. Actually, we like, we like courses and we want, we want more courses. Yes, that's what we want, please. It, well, for whatever reason, let's not project, we don't know, but I think you're right. Okay, it's comfortable. It's what we've always had. How do we change it, Joe? How do we change it? Great question. And, and again, uh, I should stress, like, this isn't something we, we all fly home and do Monday. 
right? That well, it takes a we, while. We could do it yeah, Monday. We maybe. could start. <laughs> <laughs> we could start. But uh, to answer your question, yeah, there will be pushback. There'll be pushback internally, right? Because I'm in my comfort zone. This is what I've done for a living for many years, and also from other ancillary departments. We'll probably talk about those in a little bit. But I think you need to find your place for the small wins, right? Don't. You can start small and grow it from there. I think Don mentioned that earlier. And by the way, your greatest advocate is likely to be the point of this session, which is strategic alliance with the business, right? The business isn't HR, the business isn't finance, you know, they, they're stakeholders, but getting those small wins is, is often where we need to do it. I don't, I don't want to take up a lot of time, Don, but uh, it reminded me of a, of a, of a story uh, when I took on that role. I also walked into some things that were in flight, that were in progress, and one of them was uh, there was a call center involved, and uh, they, they wanted to do warm handoff training. And they had already decided before I got there that it was going to be this multi-day class that they were going to bring everybody through. Tens of thousands of people would go through this class. I objected immediately, but I was brand new, and I got shouted down. So my team built the class. But we started a Skunk Works project, a little project on the side, where I had met one team leader in one business unit who said, this might work. And I said, would you be willing that one of my designers has created this three pictures that look like a cartoon, and I would like to just try it on your team. They're not going to come to the class. I'll take the heat. Richard's point, you have to have a leader that's willing to stand up to do that. Mm -hmm. And that team performed as good or better in every instance. And after a while, we dropped the crazy classroom training and only went with the performance support material. So sometimes it's just a small win get one or two people on the team behind you, right? And we're not talking about job elimination here. We're talking about using our time differently. Performance support will be your friend to eliminate the heavy burden. And pro I would also point to, you know, to Charles Jennings and others in the room, uh, Helena mentioned it, the 70-20-10 rule kind of comes into play here. Like if we stop with the formality of always building heavy, heavy courses and go with the performance support route, You'll have, you'll have instant wins, and people will uh, line up at your door after that. So the, so the key thing, as with Helena, winning in Algeria and then expanding to the rest, well, the rest of your territory, I was going to say the rest of the world, the rest of your territory, um, a, a, a quick, not a quick win, but a win, show the value, move on. And when you do that, you have an advocate, because you've got managers and people internally who shout for you. Does that kind of answer the question? By the way, every time I have this conversation, that's the answer find one person who will yeah. get it and will try it on a skunk works, as you said, under the radar, and then make it work and establish the value. Question for Helena here from, um, and I'm done, I'm going to come to a, a more challenging question from Christian. So Christian, you might want to stand up and ask this question, or I might come to you in a second. Um, uh, Saurav, sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Helena, um, how difficult was it implementing the program since it was global? Were there challenges balancing the organizational culture and the local culture. That's a lot of different countries. Algeria, Egypt, Brazil, uh, China, Russia. Uh, <laughs> challenging. I think that was the, the thing that I enjoyed the most because you have to understand the culture, uh, where you're going. That is the easy answer. Mm -hmm. Then I would say that the more difficult one is that treat everyone as a human being. Hmm. That's a great answer. Uh, I don't know if that is the answer, but it, it takes a, t a lot of time, effort, a lot of communication, and that is something that I learned along the way. And in the communication, the important part is listening. I beg your pardon? The important part. <laughs> 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 the important part yep. is listening, yes. and apparently the important part is also being able to articulate yourself clearly. <laughs> But it is, isn't it? Uh, yeah. but you can't treat people as people unless, they, unless you can listen to what they say, unless, of course, they can say it clearly. Right, Christian Berler says, hey, this business partner stuff isn't working for me. Those people, well, come on, I think we need to be challenging. If we're all sat down, comfortably agreeing with each other and patting ourselves on the back, there's something wrong. So Christian says, look, this is not working. There are those, a business partner might be more into legal stuff or whatever. What about being a people partner, cutting down the leaders and the people in the, in the, in the business's responsibility uh, and make them being a product owner, whereas caring for people could be located in learning and development chapters and guilds. So what do we think? Do we think, I mean, my, I've always said, look, 
help managers do their job of developing people, mm -hmm. how much is it their job? Should we be taking more responsibility for that rather than trying to get them to do more responsibility? But, um, let's, let's, Richard, what do you think mm -hmm. about this one? Because it's a, it comes back to the fundamental part of management in business. You mean managers take... Uh, managers, managers take less of a role, less responsibility. Less of a role yeah. and L&D yeah. takes more of a responsibility for it. Uh, if I understand I mean, correctly, the, if I understand the, wrong, please, I, sorry, I, I, go ahead. Go on. Mm -hmm. ah. mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So help managers do their job, whatever that is, product owning, and retake the responsibility in one way or another for the development of the people. Richard? Yeah, well, I, I think Thanks. from what I try to say, this wouldn't go exactly in this direction because you need, uh, when you, you know, leadership and management cannot be separated. Mm -hmm. It is like a continuum. You have jobs where you need more leadership cap capacity and maybe less direct management skills, but still you need both in almost all jobs. Or there are jobs where the focus is on, you know, when you go high in the hierarchy, um, it's more like a leadership-focused uh, job uh, to set the direction of the company, etc. So, so they cannot be separated. And the people part, and there I go back to Peter Drucker, is a vital part for it. So if you, I mean, this is the core of uh, a manager's and leader's jobs, because again, these are not completely different areas. They should get help in how to discharge this responsibility. But if you centralize this, you get into uh, difficult, um, I would say almost hot waters, mm -hmm. because it's very difficult, very difficult to do. You, you need closeness. Right? You need to be directly, you need to understand the daily issues, and uh, there is no one-size-fits-all solutions for all, all this, which is the danger when you centralize it. So I, I would feel very strongly that if we want L&D uh, or learning and development to be a strategic role in the company, a strategic fu function or uh, a strategic philosophy, if you will, then it needs to be down also to each individual manager. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, Helena? I completely agree. Okay. Because if we separate that, it will be new silos. So we need to walk hand in hand. Otherwise, we will not be asked to the table. Right. Otherwise, we won't be answered. Sorry, go on. Christian? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a partner. Yeah. Interesting idea, though, because it, it, if I'm, it's Christian. Yeah, if I'm hearing you right, it's not unlike uh, m many large organizations will have uh, human resources and there'll be a human resources business partner embedded into a particular line of business. My last stop at that bank was in uh, helped them build the, in the cybersecurity organization and I was actually placed in to the cybersecurity organization as that learning partner. So I've seen the learning partner model work. If your culture is accepting of it, because we're talking about a role, <laughs> and, and they may or may not want to offer that headcount. But it's an interesting model. I've seen it work. Okay, thank you for that clarification. I think, that, and thank you for asking the question. I think it's really important that we uh, do ask questions which might challenge us, and I'm going to come to one or an observation from yours, Jeff, in a minute. Your arm is almost coming out of your socket. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, the, I'm, I'm, so when the, the business, by the business part, do you mean the, the, peop, the people in L&D who are in the business or something? Sometimes they are part of L&D, but usually they are part of HR. Right. And then 
we want a course on yeah. fill in the blank, right? <laughs> okay, just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, quick, quick sanity check. Um, uh, can you just, a uh, quick hand show. Has anybody ever come to you either into your office or sent you an email saying, I'd like a course on X? <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, okay, right, okay. So it's a pretty familiar situation. And they usually manage to stipulate the length of the medium, the format, and everything. Yeah, I want a two-hour course on time management <laughs> for my team. Time. No, you just need to be a better manager. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> So, it, it, Joe, is this right? Is, it, 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 is they part of the problem? It's spot on, and, it, and it's hard to steer that ship, but, you, but you, can't, you can't cave, you can't give in. I use it as, as a question and answer, and I'm, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat what I just said, and I'm going to end with the question that usually gets me ahead of them. You know, so, okay, sit down. Tell me about what, how did you come to that conclusion. You know, walk me through it. What are you trying to solve? And here's the question they can't answer. And how will I know when I'm done? Yeah. They yep. just don't know. Unless you can get a business metric tied to that course development, we really shouldn't even consider it. And it takes some time, but usually they're kind of stumped and they'll go, they'll slink away and give me a little bit of leeway to, to change them. Slink away. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think the question is, what does success look like, right? If somebody's asking for a course and they can tell you what success looks like in business terms, well, maybe there's a reason for it. But if they can't, then they're, they're, they're talking through their hat. I'm just going to ask you very quickly, because I think we've got a fantastic crowd of people here who, have, who are working in the business and who have an answer to this question. I'm going to ask you this question very quickly. I want to share it with the person next to you and then come back to us straight away. When somebody knocks on your door, and says, I want a one-day course on widgets or underwater knitting or whatever, <laughs> what, is it, what is it that you say to them? How do you turn it around? What's, what do you say to them? Don't tell me the answer is yes, and I can have it for you tomorrow. <laughs> All right? So very quickly, what's, what's, I want just one minute of conversation, then give us your feedback. How do you turn that conversation into a performance consulting conversation? Let's get your thoughts. Go ahead. Uh, I would say what... Business need doesn't I just think mean. we've got a you know, good crowd here. Let's get some crowdsourcing going. Yeah, and, and uh, what are possible factors? What other factors are impacting this type of issue? Yes, exactly. Right? Yeah. So, because I think people should think, course is good, yeah, maybe. Yeah. But what else do you need? Yes, exactly. Because course can never do the. No, no, no. no. And, and yeah. that is only yeah. a training. So, what yeah. are you going to Sorry. do afterwards? Yeah. That's one minute you easily. Uh, well, experience for the second. Have you had a win? Have you had a time? I try to Dong. look at your... Okay. Uh, ten minutes. Dong. The bell tolls. Right. Okay. What's, what's the quick answer? What, what do we say? Anybody? Are you running? <laughs> what's... What's... Okay. So we have... We have a simple one-word answer over here, which is... Why? Okay. Has anybody got anything longer than one word? Or we can just move on. Any other answers? Yes? If that's the answer, what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm, I'm now completely lost. If you're coming with the answer to me, yes. what's the question? All right, so the, the answer is a course. Fine, what's the question <laughs> that the course answers? Oh, that's like a ninja, isn't it? It's like, oh, uh -huh. I love that. Okay, anything else? Good one. Well, I think why is a great one. I think why is a great one. And we're going to practice that before we finish today. Um, just, yeah. Well, let's do it now. Okay, okay. I'm knocking on the door. I'm going to come in and we ask for a course. Right. Hello, I'd like a course, please. Why? Yeah, it's not strong enough. Come on. <laughs> Hello, I'd like a course, please. Why? That's better. Okay. <laughs> and you might say also, go and slink away, get out. All right. Um, so, I, 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 do we have any other questions? Because I've got a lot of questions here. Any other questions people want to throw their hands up and ask very quickly? Okay. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so great question. Uh, there is a lot of content out there. Some of it's free. Some of it's in a sort of grey zone. How do we negotiate the rights to use it? Um, uh, uh, Externally, we're talking about people externally saying, yes, it's okay to use it? Yeah. Um, anybody? Look, I think it's, it's a fair question, and, and I would say start 
internally, right? Don't overlook how much great content exists within the organization from, you know, I, I picked on some subject matter experts earlier, but I love my SMEs, you know? And so I just mentioned uh, uh, my last stop, I had been helping build this uh, cybersecurity organization. There was no expertise or very much material available to us unless it was a great expense, but there are always people around the globe that are willing to, to create and to share. And it's a YouTube generation, right? Let them make mm -hmm. the stuff and put it out there and then stuff that kind of bubbles to the top to where you go, you know, that has great applicability more broadly. We should clean that up with our own instructional designers. Do that. But, you know, there's a, there's a wealth of free material lurking in your own company right now. And then, as Don says, there, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of material out there that's either free for use or at low to no cost. And by the way, when you're demonstrating this value back to the business, that cost factor is part of the conversation. You know, for a $35,000 investment in this licensing, I've been able to eliminate or reduce X, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's a that's a no-brainer for the business to back you on that. Makes sense. Yeah, Richard. Just a quick comment. One subject we have not covered was self-organization. That's one of the big management mm -hmm. subjects, by the way. Mm -hmm. And self-organization is very relevant for learning, and including learning content, because if you are in an area where you need real real-time knowledge, you need to learn from other situations, mm -hmm. the question is always how do you get access and how can you learn from this very fast? My current great disappointment, I must say, based on what I thought 10 years or five years ago, is the lack of social media usage inside companies in a targeted way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not talking about the general social yeah. media, but yeah. I'm talking about mm -hmm. using it within the company for fast uh, exchange. And I think when we talk about leadership, uh, this function, yeah, this role, mm -hmm. should also think about things that are not yet on the table. Mm -hmm. How can we self-organize for learning mm -hmm. much better, and how can we enable that? Then you take a leadership role. Is it, mm -hmm. But it's true that we're seeing... I mean, it's slower, much slower than we'd like, but I, we are seeing the use of Yammer, Slack, yeah. Microsoft Teams to do exactly that, to share information, and very often it takes place without the intervention of the learning and development team, and that should be a concern for us. If, 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 well, it shouldn't be a concern for us, it's great people are doing it, but why didn't we have something to do with it in the first place? Mm -hmm. um, we, there was a problem there that got solved by somebody and we had nothing to do with it. We, we but we could, take it, we could take in the curation component yep. of that, right? So I loved, I hated it when it first started dinging on my desk. <laughs> like they just started popping messages yep. and application developers all across the firm. Or, but then I saw the, the learning value that was going on there. My only question is, everybody's going to Don and Don's giving this answer because Don's clearly the expert but I don't know if anybody fact-checked Don, and that might be where L&D can add some value. Like, you know, we sit down and we find out that is the message we want yeah. to give and we'll curate that content, but I had nothing to do with the creation of that content, Don did. Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's a good example of us sh shifting our responsibility from being content obsessed. I, know. I would say checking, yes, of course we should do that, uh, but there is also another important part where I think that learning has a big, big role, especially because of the expertise, is to see, to just observe what's going on there, what are the discussions, and tailor for the future. And come back to the organization and see, I see that we have something going on here. It seems that people are uncertain. We don't know about a certain, I don't know, it's not a product, but how to behave in this area. And then come to the business and say, so we don't uh, risk our license to operate, what if we would do something that would secure our future, da, da, da. So uh, that is where I see the learning going forward, to be much, much more proactive. Now we are historical. We are basing our trainings on history instead of focusing on what's next. That's brilliant. When you're creating also data points, right, for, for the argument. So here's the data point you know, for somebody who comes in and asks for a learning, and the question is why, and you have no data to suggest it's even necessary, but, but I can tell you here are five things that I've been tracking on internal social media that, that do appear to be necessary. And Laurie Niles Hoffman, who's a um, consultant, used to work at the Royal Bank of Canada, works in, in Canada, has a great example of that, of using data to push back. Somebody comes in and says, we need a course on X, 
And she comes back and says, no, and this was a, a real example from her work, we've been tracking the search term you're looking for, mm -hmm. whatever it was, on the internet. Five people have asked for that mm -hmm. in the past six months. Yeah. We are not writing a course on that. There is simply no need for it. We are writing a course on this thing which everyone is looking for on the internet. So it's just a very straightforward way of prioritization. Okay, quick tough challenge, then we're going to wrap up. The tough statement comes from Jeff, and he says... <laughs> Companies have the ch companies that have the courage to solve miscasting, or I'd call it mismatching, will beat organisations that invest in learning and development. If you've got the wrong people in the wrong job, that is a real stopper on production and, and productivity. So in that case, actually, that's much worse of a problem than learning and development. That may be true. What's what's our reaction, team? People needing reskilling, we have well, the wrong role, maybe. May, maybe people need to be moved around and put into the right jobs, that's a faster way of getting to productivity. I mean, my, my answer would be, it's not either or, we need to do both things, yep. but in learning and development, our role is learning and development. We don't have a role in the recruitment and the shuffling around of people's side. Mm -hmm. But it is important, I think, to remember that performance is not just a function of knowledge and skills. It's a function of a lot of things, including being in the right job in the first place. I think it's a screaming mandate of why we need to be at the strategy table. Huh. I remember uh, this time of year, well, a no, little no bit earlier, usually the fall of every year, I'd be asked to write my training strategy or my training plan for the next year. Anybody else have that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then my question over the years would become, well, okay, but can you tell me the business's three- and five-year strategy, and, what, and then what's the people management strategy for that, and they would, you don't need that. I'm like, yeah, I do. I need to know if we're planning to have 20% more application developers in the next three years because I'm not prepared to deliver those people to you. To, so to the point of the question, yeah, as we have to move people, we have to understand the skills that they have, where they're a match, where they're a mismatch, and what we need to do to upskill them to bring them to the place where they have the greatest chance for success. And if that data is not shared with us, then we're just going to be order takers. So what I like about sessions like this is we have good conversations, we have some tough challenging questions, we also have some, a view of what it's like to be somebody like Joe, like Helena, like Richard, who have had these conversations and pushed back and said, actually no, and I've got a good reason for it, and you need to prove to me why I need to do that. And I do think that working on the foundation of Richard, showing value, as Helena has said, and building then the right operating model, as Joe has told us, will get us to the point of strategic delivery. And hopefully, Laura and everybody else, we won't be back here in 10 years' time having the same discussion. We're having a, a different discussion about how our strategies are now looking for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, please, can you thank our panel? Oh, I've got to do the last thing. Sorry, there's one last thing. One last thing, I'm going to ask them to sum up their, their, what they're saying in five words, or six words. <coughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I've not been around for a while, <laughs> but I, I see that things have not so dramatically changed. Right. And I think we need to ask ourselves why. Okay, so that's five words. It is time for change. Yeah. Right, Helena. Let's waking up the sleeping bear. Let's wake the sleeping bear. And Joe. Stop being a hammer. There we go. Stop being a hammer. Have a great break.